Welcome everyone to episode 380 of Just Joshing. I am your host, Joshua Pendelaresco. I write stuff in podcasts too. Today is story time. Once again, The Cloud Diver, Chapter 4, Part 2, in which Johnny goes deeper into the heart of his city and finds things may not be exactly what he was hoping for as well. We have Tim Niederreiter as my reading guest, and uh, that's this week. Next week I have a, some, a really cool surprise. I'm not going to give it away to you just yet. But I have a really cool surprise for next week, and I'm hoping to have a couple more cool surprises in the next couple weeks. I got a really big yes not too long ago, and I can't wait to reveal that individual when I get some good stuff there. But at the end of Chapter 4, there's going to be a... We're going to break this up a little bit. Because by the time Chapter 4 ends, Alice Zero will be ready to come into the world. Alice Zero releases July 16th, currently myself and Mackenzie Carr. And But before we do that, before I do a special little reading that week of Alice Zero... I'm going to be doing a three-parter with Marcio Catalano. If you look him up, he is an amazing, has had an amazing career doing amazing things in this life. And uh, we just had an amazing chat. I, we literally chatted for four hours. I've never had a conversation go like this. Now, I'm not going to show the full four hours of the conversation in those three parts. Probably one at least one hour of it's going to sit in the cutting room floor. But those, there's going to be three amazing hours that week of Marcio. And then the following week, I'm probably going to do a little reading of Alice Zero, just for you guys, an exclusive 10-minute read of that. So, yeah, that, that's kind of cool. I have a, a little project already done at the hands of uh, InProse Press, so I'm going to get, hopefully get an announcement on that soon enough. Uh, beyond that, yeah, just rolling along, doing my thing for the time being. All right, guys, let's just get to the reading point, shall we? This episode of Just Joshing is sponsored by Indie Imprint. Indie Imprint supports creators by creators. Whether you are writing a book or creating a video game, Indie Imprint works with its clients to produce, edit, and present their projects to the world. For more information, check out their website at www.indieimprint.com. The Cloud Diver, Level 1-4, Chapter 2, Feed Void Life, The Underscore Truth, at The Truth Is Out There, Unverified Account, at Veritas123, I find it funny that they tried to silence Lou. How is your kid doing? Two moments intersected in real time. In a past life, I was leaving town, nervous about the future, and wondering if I had made the right decision. The company had picked me up to take me to the local airport in the next town over. They had arranged transport with a police car, and there I was in the back seat surrounded by a metal mesh. I wasn't the usual rider in the back, and though the seat wasn't exactly comfortable, it was peaceful. The car was fully automated, no steering wheel like an Atlas car. This was a modern transportation at its finest. I looked at the city of Goal and then for what I thought would be the last time. A lot of familiar faces gave me the evil eyes I bailed. No doubt, my mode of transportation surprised people. Yet for all that, I looked around with a sense of sadness. These were the people I'd grown up with. They were the ones who helped shape my life. Who was I going to be without them? The present was an ugly juxtaposition. Golden was an empty, hollow place now. The void hung all around us as we drove down Main Street. No one was outside shooting the breeze or buying stuff, which gave Golden an eerie feel to it. We passed a corner restaurant called Trappers, and I saw a closed sign. Trappers was never closed at this time of day. Usually, the breakfast scout would be filling in, going for pancakes and pies. The day would begin, and everyone would be head to where it was supposed to be. Everything about our Trappers was closed, too. The post office had been burned to the ground. Ashes in the ancient emblem were all that remained. Not one person peeked outside my door. Eerie silence was their only companion. I couldn't even hear birds chirping, nor were there any cats out hunting anything that resembled rat or mouse. There wasn't even barking from dogs or anything that felt familiar. Only a couple of raccoons were waging war with garbage scattered at the town entrance. How long has it been like this? I finally managed to mutter, breaking the silence. A few weeks at least, Atlas answered, looking ahead at the road. The town did its best to stem us, with funding being what it is, though. 
There was no funding, but that was Atlas's point. Cities and counties had a very modest budget in comparison to corporations. Anything beyond basic property damage was left to its own devices. The official reason was that times were tough, the usual song and dance. Corporations got more and towns got fewer resources every year. It's just the way it was. It was why working for one of the big companies like Voilight, Commander, or Argus were considered the dream. Reality had woken me up. My home was plague infested. Before I knew it, we were nearly through the whole town. While I wondered where I was going, it struck me how quickly we moved through the place. Home is always smaller than you remember coming back. When I was a kid, Golden seemed like the largest place I had ever seen. The houses were huge and the city seemed like the biggest thing ever. There was hardly any thought to the world outside. The buildings and backyards and gardens and trees in Golden had been the most magical places on earth. And now that I was older, the magic had receded. It seemed rather small and quaint now that I'd been away from the place a few years. It seemed ordinary. After we drove through the Lorm farm still in town, I saw the first sign of normal human living to the right of me. I'd figured time would have gotten to him, but here he was, hobbling down the street towards the convenience store up the street. Old man Justin was no longer waving his cane at kids. He would curse him for doing things like hopping the fence and cutting through his lawn to get to the playground. One time he had chased me when I was with my friend Scott for a hop in the fence in his backyard to get to the corner store. Afterwards, we made a point to do as stealthily as possible, as I was afraid he'd hear us again. The old man was no longer quite so spry. Father Time had caught up to him for sure, but the current landscape of the town played a bigger role. Where are we going? Gumblade answered me. The hospital. You need to see what's happened to this place. As we passed the town church, another blast from the past came just outside the surprisingly still open convenience store. It was my first crush, Shannon Miller, pushing a baby carriage down the sidewalk with another bun in the oven. Shannon had been the prettiest girl known in high school. I'd known back then that I didn't like her. Not one bit. Absolutely, positively lying to myself about my feelings the whole time. I'd never done anything about it either, not until it was far too late. That said, we ended as friends, and that's not a terrible thing, right? I wondered who the lucky man was as we drove by. The hospital was located at the far end of town towered above the rest of the city like a mini skyscraper with tinted windows. It was a little piece of modern civilization in a city that looked locked back in time. There were an awful lot of cars in the parking lot. It seemed like the whole town was there. Maybe it was. That was an unpleasant thought. I gulped. It's pretty bad, Gunblade said. Once you go in, you won't be able to unsee it. I nodded. After parking at the back of the lot, we got out of the car and proceeded to walk to the entrance. Familiar faces were in mourning when I walked in the door. Surprise echoed in our eyes as we recognized each other. I had found the town's life. It was here in all its sterile glory. Orleys were cleaning down the walls and floors. Vinegar and pine pervaded my nostrils. Yet, underneath it all, I could detect a rank odor. Last night's dinner tried to be insistent about coming up my throat and out of my mouth, but I argued back down into my stomach. This was a terrible place. Well, well, been a long time since we've seen you in these parts, said a familiar drawl from past the reception office. Childhood memories flooded back to me. At five years old, we were building wooden structures in the play area. Scott was a bully when I met him. He would steal my box and my lunch, and I started going to kindergarten at Glen Street Public School. Finally, I punched him in the face in front of the teachers in the class. We've been friends ever since. He was a doctor now. It had been a few years, but I could see that, despite the bags under his eyes, then stress lines on his face. There was genuine happiness seeing me there. How you doing, Scott? We greeted each other with a high five and knuckling up. Managing, I guess. Void life let you off the leash? Um, I searched for something that seemed remotely plausible. Nothing came to me. Fortunately, Atlas sensed me drowning. In light of an emergency, we granted him leave. You security, then? Scott frowned and shoot out his hand. Let's just say we look out for the interests of the conglomerate. The smirk on Gunther's face was priceless. I swear to this day that she was fighting down a chuckle. I somehow was smart enough to keep my mouth shut and simply nodded. The last thing I needed was to explain how I'd gotten to this point. Hell, I didn't even believe it and I lived through it. Did you hear to see Lisa? At the mention of her name, my eyes widened and the world became surreal. I wanted to scream. I didn't hear the rest of the words. All I heard was Scott give me a room number and I was off, leaving everything behind. She was sick, ailing like the rest of the town. I didn't want to know how bad she was. I needed to see it with my own eyes. There was no Gone Blade or Alice, or even Golden. Lisa was my whole universe, and she was infected. The 
Yeah, I know. I'm kind of meaning Levy off right there. Um, but there is a reason for that. Um, well, I'm saying a lot of ums here. There is definitely a reason why I left you at that moment in time. Um, after all, this I've been building this moment since the whole story started. And Scott's going to talk to his love and kind of just see just how much you really can't go home again. No promises. And as you can see, a lot less jokes in this part of the novel. Um, so it's important, I think. Any any book of comedy in it can definitely have serious story to it, the way I see it. Um, the trick is balancing out the tone. And the way to do that is just to be very honest about what you're trying to accomplish in your scenes. Some scenes are far less funny than others. Some are far more funny than others. Um, that's just the way it goes. And you have to be careful not to put too much ha-ha in a serious scene. That doesn't mean you can't have comedy. I got a really comedic moment coming up really soon, actually. I, th I personally enjoyed. But that all said... I, this is definitely not the part of the story where, I, where I'm trying to be funny. I'm trying to convey a message. And now, that all said, uh, next week you'll find out exactly what it is. But for now, let's go to our new our friend, Timothy Niederreiter. He's been on the show a couple times as, as a guest. And now he gets to read from his latest book. And that's what we're going to next. Hello, people, and thanks, Josh, for giving me a chance here. I'm Tim Niederreiter, and I'm here to read to you from my little epic novel called Demon Scroll, available now from Amazon.com. So give me a second here. Yeah. Demon Scroll is a big epic fantasy. This is from Chapter 1 because it gets pretty complicated pretty fast, of course. And it follows a character, this chapter follows a character named Melissa, who's just returned to this city, the area around where she grew up. So here we go. As the caravan came to a stop by the governor's orchard, Melissa felt, only for a moment, glad she was back in the land where she had been born. The emotion quickly turned to dread as she thought of the possibility her parents might still live in Sokot. Melissa ought not to have to meet them again, given how they'd parted those years ago. Mother and father could forget her for all her concerns. She wished a different life than the one they had pushed her on. They had pushed on her, or motioned to the bright blue painted roof of a pavilion down the stone walkway off the road. That's the governor's shade, if I'm not mistaken. Melissa nodded, then pointed with a finger as the shapes of people approached from the far side a party of a dozen well-dressed members of the nobility surrounding a slim woman in a formal black gown. Governor Lokoth herself, she asked. Orm's eyebrows rose. You may be right, he said. See those two? He indicated a pair of hulking men, both with skin a shade of gray that blended in into a pale green. Shirtless, they flanked the woman in black, each carrying a heavy mace in one hand. I see them, Melissa said. They're demons, said Orm, members of the governor's forces. You're sure? Melissa asked. Orm nodded. I've seen the men like that in the north I've seen men like that in the north too, in Wagewood, last I can recall. Melissa had never seen a demon before, she frowned. They look so human. Look closer. You'll see the demons face faces aren't like ours, and they have ridges like horns over their brows. Melissa squinted. They're a hundred yards away, she said. You have a be you have better eyes than mine, even at your age. He shrugged. I have, I have to keep some, some kind of edge. Being sharp-eyed is practical, given our profession. I can't disagree, said Melissa. Lady Nassabron's carriage rumbled to a stop near the end of the path, leading to the pavilion. The door opened, and the lady's sword servant descended the steps. She carried the small sword at her hip and the great sword on a sling over her shoulder in an ornate sheath and baldric. After her... Lady Nassabron's niece, Elaine, climbed down. She wore a finely pleated skirt and a jacket of white over her maroon tunic. Elaine had spoken little to anyone outside the carriage throughout the weeks of travel. Melissa suspected Lady Nassabron would frown on her niece, a young noble woman herself, consorting with the commoners. When Lady Nassabron emerged from the carriage, she wore a dark hat and a smile that came from with living every day for decades with a full belly. She joined her niece and her sword servant, then motioned to Melissa and Orm. 
You two, follow. I won't let Governor Lokoth have number of me by so much. Or I'm glanced at Melissa, but she was already moving to join the three noble women. Any day she refused to simply refused a simple request by someone that's so highborn was a day she risked her career. Or I'm followed her. Very good. You two are well on task, said Lady Nassabron. Now stay at each flank. Ariel, she nodded to her short servant. Lead on. Ariel threw back her hood, revealing long, white, blonde hair. She marched to the, up the path toward the pavilion. The other four followed her at Lady Nassaron's legal pa- regal pace. No one rushed a lady with so much magical ability, evidently. Not even an imperial governor of Jadakats. Under the shadow of the pavilion, dark-haired and dark-clad Governor Tandis Lokoth met them, leaving most of her party a few yards behind. She kept her demon bodyguards close. Did she fear the wizardess, or were the guards just part of the custom? Melissa could not answer those questions, given her less than noble roots. She had studied many things in books, but the demons who served the governor throughout Tanquan were not among them. Lady Nassibron, said the governor in a smooth voice, I've been eagerly awaiting your arrival. And grown older for it, I see, said the lady witch. I take it you need me, or you would not have summoned me south by name. You think correctly, said the governor, but before we discuss that matter... Allow me to inform you of the other I requested who should be here shortly. You wanted another wizard as well, Lady Nassaron sniffed. I'm insulted. Not just any wizard, Governor Lokoth smiled slightly. I believe you're personally familiar with Deckard Hadrian. Lady Nassaron stiffened visibly. You'd rat summon that demon hunter here at the same time as me? And you didn't think to mention that in your letter? I hope there's no problem. Nassibron snorted. A problem? I daren't think you care about feelings, so in this case, in that case, nothing you should, would understand, Tandis. Melissa's gaze followed the governor's expressions. It changed from one of smug superiority and knowledge and position both to one of ice cold venom. That face Melissa knew all too well from looking at the mirrors. You may tell me how you feel, Killeen, said the governor, but in front of my people, you will call me by the title given me, by mother, glorious Mother Mercy herself. You know what is appropriate. A learned wizardess. Such as you cannot claim ignorance. An impressive rant, Governor. I mean, meant only the offense you earned. Deckard Hadrian may be the greatest demon hunter who will ever live. Still, he is a man of a questionable reputation. I will leave it at that. Lokoth's lip twitched. Her face, mostly free from aging lines, remained a mask of impassive, unemotional calm. Her eyes flicked to a lane where the dark-haired young woman stood at her aunt's side. Girl, you are Palavian, are you not? She said. Elaine bowed her head. As my mother before me, Governor... Indeed, your mother is an honorable lady, though I think she does not practice magic as her, as her sister here. In, I fail to see the relevance of this, Governor, said Lady Nassabron. Melissa glanced at Elaine, whose face was reddening. Governor, my mother is my, my is having my aunt tutor me, said the girl. And your father? He is Palavi. Is that not true? Indeed, Governor. Good, said Lokoth. I take it you have studied the most common traits of the Palavian people, girl? Leave my student alone, Governor, said Lady Nassaron, bristling. The demon guards stepped forward, each moving with precision and more no more than necessary. They made no effort to lift their heavy steel maces. Ariel, the sword servant, tensed, standing, stance going rigid. Melissa resisted the urge to re- reach for the spear hanging from her sh- shoulder sling. Orm backed away slightly, clearly intimidated by the demons. Governor Lokoth shrugged, raising both hands. That's plenty of anger. I will honor your request this time, Lady Nassabron. Appreciated, said the old witch, but I warn you, don't push me, my student, or me, Governor. Noted, Governor Lokoth snipped the air. I take it that that goes for your guards, too. What would you have to say about my guards, asked Lady Nassabron. Not much, I'm afraid, said the governor, smiling, smug smile reappearing. Or made no response, eyes still on the demon guards. Melissa took a deep breath, too deep. You, said the governor, pointing at her. What is your name, guard? I'm called Melissa. Your whole name, said the governor. She bowed her head. Melissa Dorian, governor. Lokoth tapped her chin with a finger. How long have you been in the employ of Lady Nassipron? She's never employed me. I'm a member of the caravan guards she selected. Indeed, Lokoth smiled, turning to Lady Nassipron. You didn't even bring private troops. I'm afraid not all of us have the same kind of resources as an imperial governor. It seems I was wrong to summon you from the Cost Valley. One mage, even one wizard, will not be enough to with, assist me with my trouble. And you were equally vague in your letter. I must say, Governor, this trouble of yours is still a mystery to me. 
And yet here you are. The Magister's Guild of my city will be displeased, but there is no helping that. Melissa fought back a grimace. The mention of the Guild of Sokot stung. The Magister's had banished her from the south years ago. Lady Nassibron laughed, not bothering to stifle or suppress the harsh sound. I fear life in the valley is becoming boring, and for my students' health, I thought warmer weather would suit us both. Lokoth's smile never dimmed. On that, we can agree, Kellyn. Tandis, it has been some time indeed, Lady Nassibron smiled. Actually smiled at the governor. Melissa stared at the two women. Elaine's jaw went slack. Twenty-two years and perhaps a few days, said the governor, when Mother Mercy chose me to govern. You made a terrible mage. The change has been for the best, said Lady Nassaron. I hope you're a better teacher now than you were then, Lokoth smiled, because I have a task for you along those lines. I already have a student. If I recall, you are more than capable of instructing more pupils at one time. Killeen, I wasn't your only student last I saw you. I'm getting older, Tandis, and here you have a ma- summoned a mage with more experience than I, if you need a tutor. Not a tutor, a drill instructor, and Hadrian refuses to fill that role, if you must know. Lady Nassibron sm- sighed. He still seems intent on taking his knowledge to the grave with him. I thought you hated the demon hunter. Hate is too strong a word, but the man is bent on squandering that what he has. Watch your words, Killeen, said Lokoth. They say he can hear his name on the wind. Lady Nassibron scoffed. Nonsense. Such rumors mean nothing. I suppose you know better than I, said Lokoth. Can you train five mages in the art at the same time? I can and have trained more of that than that at once, said Lady Nassibron. The question I think you should ask is how long such training will take. As quickly as you can, said Lady said Governor, said the Governor, and as thoroughly. Tandis, you realize training quickly and training thoroughly are opposed elements like fire and water or sprites and banes. And yet sprites and banes coexist in every mortal heart, balanced by this mind and spirit. Governor Lokoth smiled. How long would you estimate before the students sh- your students can be battle ready? Elaine said Lady Nassibron. How long have you been studying battle spells? Two years, teacher. Are you ready for a battle, Elaine? I'd not ask to be tested in one. Lady Nassibron nodded. And how long before you may study a sacra scroll? Another year at least, said Elaine. Correct. You see a governor you see, Governor, I agree with her. I won't push a student of mine into battle before he or she prepares for it. To do so would be the utmost waste of time and energy. Is that so? Lokoth shook her head. What can you do in four months? Now that depends on the students, said Lady Nassaron. Those with clever minds and strong prior studies may pick up the skills fast enough to fight in in that time. Melissa's heartbeat grew loud in her ears. They were talking about training mages, maybe more than mages, maybe wizards with the power to take sacroforms. She stood, enraptured and excited by the conversation. To think she'd been lucky enough to be called over by Nas Brown out of sheer coincidence. Or her replacement, another blessing from on high. Clouds to the north parted, revealing a distant arc of the world's rings, the nearest of which gleamed brighter and more, with a more metallic gold than the others. The warm, rough draft rustled the clothes in the pavilion as the wind shifted quickly. Perhaps we ought to search the sky, said the governor. Hadrian may be due to arrive, given the way things are shifting. Lady Nassibron shrugged. You remember the, some things from your studies, I see. You think too positively of my younger self, said Lokoth. Lord, Lady Nassibron not snorted in derision. Obviously. Bring your people, said the governor. Walk with me. You want to see him approach? Of course. When I grew up, Hadrian's beauty and powers were legendary. Likewise, said Lady Nassibron. The party followed the witch and the governor out from under the pavilion into the hot light of day. Melissa and the others gazed at the bright heavens. Though they spoke of Daggard Hadrian, Melissa doubted she would see the immortal demon hunter in the sky. In all of Jadiketz, only two men were said to live forever. Cyrus bowed to the Cost Valley, far from the far to the north of the Imperial capital, and stood was one of them. Daggard Hadrian was the other. In Melissa's books, she had read of others, but many of those who once claimed the gifts of youth and life eternal, only two remained. Of the many who once claimed the gifts of youth and life eternal, only two remained. There, Orm pointed, the Lord of Winds. The others, except for the impassive demon guards, crowded in, crowded to him, following his gesture to the sky with their collective gaze. Melissa squinted against the light of the morning sun. A gleaming speck of reflected light grew above them as the shape began to resolve. The form of a man grew clear as he approached. The man wore a robe of polished iron. Garment looked black against the sky, but for glints of brighter metal on the shoulders and wide and a wide belt. How could he fly with such a weight on his back and no wings? 
Melissa furrowed her brow. He was a mage, that much was certain. But she lacked the studies to say what one required to wield such an ability as flight. As Hadrian drew closer, his long black hair flowed free from him. He wore a sordid side sheathed in a black scabbard, and he carried a pack over one shoulder. At first he seemed alone, but as he reached the air over the pavilion, Elaine cried a warning and pointed to the sky above him. A creature, half dra- half again decorated Hadrian's height, dove toward him in near freefall, le- leathery reptilian wings held close to his scaly humanoid body. The creature swooped toward the man in the iron robe. What is that? asked Melissa. A Vakari warrior. The governor's lips trembled. Most likely the creature is trained in magic as well. Get back, everyone. The governor's party of hangers-on scrambled for the pavilion. Elaine and Ariel took Lady Nassabron and led her to the building. Moving faster than Melissa, guessing, guessed the aging witch could manage on her own. Orm and Melissa brought up the rear with the two demon guards and the governor herself. Melissa had not gotten a positive first impression from Lokoth, yet the governor showed her true nature in the crisis, springing to protect the citizens first. The Vakari warrior screeched an inhuman cry as, De- as Hadrian hurled it from the air. The reptilian creature struck the ground not ten yards from where M- or Melissa and Orm retreated beside the governor. The lizard man roared, staggering upright. The reptilian loomed over three yards tall and built in the upper bo- and built thick in the upper body to support the pinions that, until a moment ago, held him aloft. Deckard Hadrian descended toward the aggressor, surrounded by the sound of unseen trumpets playing a divine symphony. The Akari warrior turned, eyes locking on the governor. The reptile said no words, but the murderous intent and evident in that gaze told Melissa everything she needed to know. The Vakari wove a sign in the air, making a sound like a chattering a chattering insects or vermin. The demon guards lunged to fill the space between their mortal charge and the governor. Orm dove for the cover for cover behind one of the supports for the of the pavilion. The song ringing, ringing from Deckard Hadrian grew louder as he darted toward the Vakari. The creature beat his wings, hurling himself sideways on the breeze. Hadrian rode toward it. The man in the iron robe hit the ground like a thunderclap where the dragon had stood. But the warrior already sailed overhead, flames dancing to discordant songs at the end of his clawed hands. An attack spell said the governor through clenched teeth. Melissa stared as the Vakari flew toward them, building the ball of fire in both hands. Deckard turned and took to the air on another updraft that seemed to come from nowhere, but it pushed him in an arc, away from the dragon-like man. He would be too late if the, dra- if the Vakari hurled those flames. The reptilian warrior appeared to re- realize the same thing as Melissa. With a hoarse, rasping laugh, the lizard man hurled fire at the governor. Melissa shoved Governor Lokoth to one side. The blast struck her, carrying her not carrying not just the heat of a flame, but a massive weight like a huge bludgeoning fist. The world shattered like a glass mirror around her, and she flew backward into a beam supporting one of the pavilion's arches. The wooden column, column splintered. She fell to the stone floor, black spots swimming in her vision, and fighting to breathe to return some air to her lungs. Her spear's head clacked against the tile. Yet everything seemed all right somehow. Melissa lay on her side, her world moving in falling fragments. In one fragment, the demon guards raced to the governor's side. In a second shard of consciousness, one filled with the sound of blessed music, Deckard Hadrian seized the Vakari, the towering Vakari warrior, by the throat. He lifted the creature with him in one hand as he took to the air. In the next falling mirror glimpse, Melissa saw the Vakari warrior hit the ground in a broken heap. Shards hit the ground, and the fragments of her perception began to fit together. Orman and Elaine rushed to Melissa's side. Ariel, her small sword drawn, advanced on the fallen Vakari. Deckard Hadrian's face appeared before Melissa. Then, the world went dark. And that's the end of chapter one of Demon Scroll. To find out what happens to more of these characters, Melissa and Deckard and the whole mess of them, you should you can go to Amazon.com and read it right now. It's Demon Scroll. It's available on all Amazon retail stores. It's not available on uh, anywhere else but you can get it in print or an ebook so thanks for listening everybody i really did enjoy reading this i have not read this scene aloud ever so please pardon the little mistakes the ums and ahs and the errors i made also i should add i am a host of a podcast myself i host a live after reading and that's available at mentalsellerpublications.com that's seller with a c m e n t 
A L C E L L A R publications.com. And you can find more of my stuff there and you can read my books. They're all available on Amazon.com. I have a whole mess of them now. Demon Scrolls, just one of them. Oh, and uh, excuse me, but the sh- the sequel to Demon Scroll, Shadow Prince, this should be out in a week or two after you hear this. Hopefully, I'm I'm hard at work with it right now as I record this, but who knows exactly when this will go live? Uh, so th- look for that sometime in late June or early July. And I appreciate all the time you've given me. So thanks for listening, and I'll send you back to Josh now. So take it easy, folks. It's been good chatting with you. Bye. Something wicked this way comes. Prairie Gothic is a new collection of psychological horror stories set on the vast Canadian prairies by up-and-coming talents. And we need your help. By contributing to Prairie Gothic through Kickstarter, you can unlock special swag, exclusive contributor-only events, and even have a song written about you. Visit kickstarter.com slash profile slash prairie soul to find out more and see what's waiting for you in the wide open spaces. Thanks, Tim. That was awesome, my friend. Uh, Tim is a accomplished author and podcast. The description for his book uh, and where you can buy it is in the link below. So definitely check it out if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, Tim, man, thanks for doing this. We got to have you back on the podcast and an interview somewhere down the road. Somewhere in my break 400. Can you believe I'm like 20 episodes away from 400, ladies and gentlemen? I am approximately six weeks away from this milestone. What am I going to do with it? I think I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. So I'm going to close the show with two really cool announcements. The first one has to do with Susie Vidori. And the second one has to do with me. The first one is Susie. Susie is going to be sponsoring the podcast starting starting this week. Uh, you're going to see an ad starting with her for the next month about her next book. Well, Walla Wishes, I should say. I want to say Walla Wishes for some reason, but it's actually Walla Wishes, the final book in her saga. I think that's really cool that she's finished it. I'm really happy to see the end of the series. And and, uh, Susie's a great writer and she knows exactly what she wants. And I think um, she she tells compelling stories and she's been doing this now on a regular basis for a while. And I can't wait to, even though the pandemic has definitely slowed some things down, one of the constant the universe appeals in life is that Susie's going to succeed in her writing career, and I know she is. So, Susie, thank you very much for what you're doing for the show. But there's also going to be two Zoom casts in the next two months. Um, this month, on the 25th, is going to be a quiz show. That's right. Susie and I are going to be putting together a little quiz show in regards to her book launch. Um, it's going to be airing live on my channel and maybe a few other things. I'm going to definitely be... Uh, making that a more of an announcement probably by Tuesday I'll have everything nailed down the way it needs to be nailed down uh, I'll know guests I'll know the fact I know what the prizes are um, but I'll let Susie make that announcement herself first before I do it um, but yeah I'm looking forward to it it's, I'm going to be I'm going to be a quiz master for the first time ever it's like it's like I'm a game show host It's it'll be fun I think it'll be a blast but the second is going to be what my 400 episode is going to be it's going to be the Alice Zero Tea Party july 16th i'm getting i'm going to be contacting i've already started to contact a variety of guests to come on to my show um we're going to do a little bit of fun of, of reading and gaming and tea drinking the whole time now t- to what degree does this look like i'm not sure just yet i have something i really want to accomplish with it if i can but if i can't um i'll definitely move on to what's next but yeah i'm really excited for what the future holds and on that note Thank you for listening to this episode of Just Joshing. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a number of different ways. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. I'm on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, pretty much every podcast platform you can imagine. I am there. Um, so you can you can just click one, subscribe, leave a review. Thank you to everybody that's left a review, by the way. Um, I appreciate it. Share the podcast to the world. Number one. Number two. Um, my books... 
Uh, you can get the Cloud Diver currently currently on Amazon exclusively right now. Uh, Cloud Diver is a cyberpunk steampunk adventure. Johnny follows a girl into the gunblade, gets caught in the cloud, gets a file that everybody from zombie mobsters to unicorn to fart rainbows want. I promise you it'll be a one-of-a-kind ride. You've obviously been listening to it for every weekend for the last two or three months. Uh, it's been a blast to uh, write. It's been a blast to produce. And I thank everybody for listening so far. But if you want to support this, buy the book. That'd be great. Uh, my YouTube channel is Joshua Pentelaresco. My Twitter and Instagram is at jpentelaresco. I have a column at firstcomics.com. I have a newsletter you can sign up for if you want to get the latest. All that to say, stay inspired, guys. Keep doing your thing. And I'll see you guys next week. Josh. Josh. The Cloud Diver, Chapter 4, Part 2. Feed Void Life. The underscore truth. The tr- hashtag, not hashtag. Uh.